Thank you for joining us. You are a part of an elite group who recognizes that black women's health should be at the forefront of the national conversation. We are mothers, daughters, activists, entrepreneurs, entertainers, corporate warriors, and more, who help boost the economy and often drive the national conversation. For 38 years, the Black Women's Health Imperative has strived to amplify our voices, help enact policy that protects us, research our issues, create programs that enhance our lives, and produce events like this one to ensure we keep the conversation going about the issues that matter to us most. So, let's get started with our program. Good evening. I'm Linda Goler Blount, President and CEO of the Black Women's Health Imperative. Thank you for joining us for our series on Courageous Conversations. Tonight, we're going to focus on obesity, healthy lifestyles, and Black women. Obesity affects every system of the body, and it's associated with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, certain cancers, and about 240 other conditions and syndromes. More than 93 million Americans live with obesity or overweight, which the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention define as a body mass index greater than 30. <clears throat> but it's not that simple, and we'll learn that these measures may not be appropriate for Black people. For African American women in the U.S., the numbers are even more daunting. Four out of five may be considered overweight or obese. Lack of access to fresh fruits and vegetables, seeking comfort through food, the inability to get sufficient exercise are often cited as the main reasons people have obesity. But unfortunately for black women, one reason the lack of self-control is too often carelessly and derisively thrown about by healthcare providers and society in general. If one group in the society has self-control, it's black women. This is dangerous and deeply stigmatizing. In this society, overweight and obesity are considered a character flaw. So often the underlying causes of, of obesity are not fully examined when it comes to black women. However, studies have shown that when we are stressed or during tension filled times, our bodies literally increase their production of a stress hormone called cortisol. Black women have on average about 15% more cortisol in their bloodstreams at any point in time as compared to white women, and it makes a difference. We need to understand what it means to live as a black woman in this society in this time. And to do that, we must look at racial and gender discrimination. For example, the Black Women's Health Study found a causal relationship between experiencing racism and weight gain they found that if you gave black women and white women the same high fat diet, black women gained more weight and gained it faster. If you gave us the same low fat diet, black women lost less weight and it took longer to lose that weight. Tanae Lewis, uh, a researcher out of Emory University found that racial and gender discrimination literally affects us at the DNA level, triggering our inflammatory and metabolic responses which raises our risk for diabetes and heart disease and cancers and other obesity-related syndromes. Arlene Geronimus coined a term called weathering. She found that black women literally aged faster than white women. And we black women are weathering a lot of stress these days. Enter COVID-19. Black women now essential are likely to work, more likely to work in high-risk jobs facing an often unmasked and angry public we are also likely to be the sole breadwinners of our house, for our households. And so we may self-medicate through food or alcohol to deal with the stress of unemployment, homeschooling, loss of income, or the loss of our homes. And when a person has obesity, it certainly contributes to the risk of developing severe COVID-19 disease and death. Tonight, we brought together an excellent panel who will look at overweight and obesity from a number of important perspectives. Our moderator this evening is Leslie Foster. Leslie has spent nearly two decades as a trusted and respected journalist in the greater Washington DC area and as a weeknight anchor for WUSA 9's evening broadcasts. Her career work has been recognized with numerous Emmy Awards, including three Emmys for best anchor, 
as well as the prestigious Edward R. Murrell Award. She gives her energy to many causes throughout the metropolitan DC area, including leading WUSA 9's impact series that connects WUSA 9 journalists with the community to help achieve equity. Leslie, we could not be happier to have you moderate tonight's discussion. Thank you so much, and the screen is yours. Thank you, Linda. I'm really honored to join all of you tonight for what we believe will be a courageous and insightful conversation. And thank you to the Black Women's Health Imperative for bringing us all together. Uh, you know, there is a statistic out there from the CDC that four out of five uh, Black women are considered overweight or obese. And that statistic is simply arresting. It stopped me in my tracks and really requires us to take a deeper look at what the causes of this could be. And so tonight we hope to leave you with a roadmap so that you will have some agency to take control of your own lives, the decisions that you're able to make, to understand more about this journey that we're all on, and also to do more than just survive these tough times. We want you to thrive. So we want you to walk with joy and light and purpose and possibility. And that is what this is really all about, to talk about all of those things so that you can be your best and healthiest self. This is your conversation and you get to have a say. So do us a favor and right now start thinking about those great questions that you're gonna have for our panel and for our special guests that I'm going to introduce in just a moment. Put them in the chat. We're gonna aggregate them. And toward the end, we'll have about 10 minutes for you to have your say. So thank you for joining us tonight. And why don't we kick things off with a special conversation with our special guest, Kim Whitley. Perhaps, perhaps you've heard of Kim Whitley. For 30 <laughs> years, she's been shining as a comedian and an actress and so much more. You could call her a Renaissance woman because she is everywhere doing everything. And you may know her from her frequent appearances on Larry David's Curb Your Enthusiasm or on the series 20s, but that is just the tip of the iceberg because she's been doing it long and strong for nearly 30 years. And recently she added the title of mother and we're gonna explore that quite a bit more as well. So Kim, we welcome you, your wit and your wisdom and we are so grateful for your grace and your time and your spirit. So let's get right to it. You know what, people, people have been looking at your social media going, hmm, <laughs> is looking good. What is she doing? And so why don't we start there and talk about your weight loss journey over the years and, and your son and how he has motivated you to take this journey. Tell us more about how it started and how it's going. Well, thank you so much, you know, and it, 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 it is a journey. Let's go ahead and start that. Um, I was born a chubby little girl. And um, one thing I remember my, mom, my mother telling me when I got older was uh, she said, you know, if I knew better, I would have done better. She said, I would have fed you uh, fruits and vegetables instead of candy and bread. She said, but I didn't know any better. And so, um, I guess I was the only one. I struggled with my weight my whole life. Uh, but then I remember seeing my mother, she lost 75 pounds and she changed the way she was eating and I saw her working out. Uh, so she was a, a good example. And, and as I've gotten older and been in the business, I have a son, he's nine years old. Uh, but I went to the doctor, the doctor said, you're pre-diabetic. And he said, hey, if you don't get these numbers down, I'm um, gonna put you on some medicine. I was like, wait, hold up, hold up. There's a lot going on. My mother passed away of a stroke. Um, she had diabetes, you know, things going on. I said, well, let me, I, I have a little boy. I want to be here for him and I want to be able to play with him. You know, when you're bigger, your joints hurt, it's hard to move around. Um, so therefore I got a, um, an opportunity uh, that came my way. I say it was God sin. Um, as WW uh, came and offered me a partnership an ambassador and WW was formerly known as Weight Watchers. I have done every diet in the world. And I think that's why WW has made a difference in my life because it's not a diet, it's a way of life. It has taught me so much on how 
to live and how to to eat well. So, you know, not to just jump all over the place, but it's been a wellness journey and it has given me a healthy lifestyle. And I am now to date 29 pounds down from the start of the COVID to now. I said I wanted to come out of the COVID better than I went in. And I am 20. I got one more pound, one more pound to get to 30. <laughs> And you can do it. You can do it. I said that same thing that we are all going through this really tough time. And I hope that all of us emerge better, whatever the goal is for you personally, that you emerge from this really difficult time as a better version of yourself. And I think it's really great that you mentioned journey because we're in this environment where it's get thin quick, lose this quick. We want fast results. And I think what you've acknowledged is that when you make the decision, that's the first part, but getting to that healthy takes a while. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I wonder for you, you've been successful for decades in an industry that is hyper-focused on weight, on how you look, and you have been able to be successful uh, in all your states of your journey. And can you talk a little bit about how difficult it is to, to have come along on this journey and to be in the industry that you've chosen and really to be a survivor in a lot of ways? Well, you're definitely in the industry about looks. How does it look? Uh, but I always say, how does it feel? If I feel good about me, now I don't feel good being pre-diabetic, so that doesn't feel good. But when I feel good about myself and I know that right now, this time in life, like right now with you, Leslie, right now, I feel good about myself because we live moment to moment. I can't worry about how big I was and what I did yesterday. I can't worry about tomorrow, but what I can worry about is right now. So how I live my journey and how, how I live my life and, and on this journey was how do I feel now? I feel confident. I feel strong. Do I want to make a change? Yes, but it's one step at a time. I can't say, oh, in, in 30 days, I'm going to be this. I would like to be. We plan. But in this industry, if I was, I would not be successful if I was beating up on myself every day. Because what it takes is to be confident about yourself when you go in these rooms and your meetings and when you're performing for people. You have to be confident who you are at that moment. Of course, I've been up and down. And when I lost a lot of weight, I got different kind of roles. Now they did give me different things. When I'm bigger, I get the mother, the auntie. When I'm smaller, I get the sex, sexy girl, the, this and that. It is what it is. I chose an industry that they are into looks, but it is changing. Even Monique has lost weight. And she used to say, you know, I don't, you know, forget the skinny girls, but even Monique is not trying to be skinny, but she was trying to be healthy. Lizzo, Lizzo now is out. She can show her body. So the industry is changing that bigger women are, of course, accepted and loved, but it really gets down to health. And if you're big and you're healthy, bravo. But it really, for me, I want to look good. I want to feel good. But I got to be healthy or I'm not going to be around. And, I, and that is just the truth. You want to be here for Joshua, who is yeah. your number one motivation right now. It I, is my number one. People may look at you, Kim, and they see your success, but they may not understand the circuitous route it takes to get there, right? Because anybody embarking on a weight loss journey knows you, knows you have peaks, you have valleys, you have plateaus. How did you push through those tough times mm -hmm. to emerge? What did you say to you to keep going? Who who is part of your posse that's keeping you going? I like I like that word you put in there, circuitous. Whatever <laughs> that was, my daddy would like that word. That was a good one. Yes, my route. That's a journalist for you. She pulled the big <laughs> word up. Yes, I'm gonna use that in the sentence today. Uh, it, <laughs> It takes a village and all of us. And um, I'm going to tell you uh, about WW and how, and, I, and of course I push the brand. Of course I'm an ambassador, but the fact that it's worked for me, I've been on everything. This works. And I, and I say, because the old WW, I never was on that. I don't know, but this has an app. It has an app that keeps me accountable. And it, 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 it has 
all kind of fun. I call it my genie in the pocket. I can pull it up. I put in my points. I get recipes. I got friends on there. So I got all my friends because I don't want to be healthy by myself. I asked all my friends, you want to take this journey with me? We all started and we've lost over 300 pounds together. It's like, 20, like 21 of us or something like that. But you know what makes it out? Because when you do it with a friend or do it with a family member and they know that you're serious, they're not going to bring the cake in the house. They're not going to bring the candy in the house. That's like dealing with a drug addict. It's just the truth. Why would you do that when you know I like sugar? You're going to bring me sugar. I'm working on something. I want to be a better me. So it's good to get a group of people together or your friends and say, look, I want to do this. Can you help me? Just be with me, support me. And that doesn't mean badger me, just be with me. And if I fall down, just say, hey, you you know, you just had a little, a little made of this bad decision today, but tomorrow we'll eat, we'll eat right again. So that that has been um when we say the route, the route. Now I'm at a place where I can live with this. Mm -hmm. and, and you might see me. I might go up, say I fall off, really fall off. I don't know how, because it's learning how to eat right fruits, vegetables. I eat everything. I eat beans. I eat all kind of food. But no one taught me. Just like you said, I didn't know what to eat. It's really mm -hmm. educating women, men. I got men in the group. If you're not educated and you don't know what to eat or how to eat, you're not going to eat right. Instead of putting a ham hock in my greens, I put a turkey leg in there. But I eat them. <laughs> and they taste just as good. And Listen, I've got one last question for you. And I wonder how you feel about this whole idea of the stigma of being overweight, the stigma of obesity, the stigma of the language that we use toward others and, and how you think that impacts people on their weight loss journey. I read something that says, you know, when you speak ill of someone who is on this journey and you're saying things to them that are not positive, it causes them to continue to gain weight. So words have power, right? Yes, they do. It causes you to give up. You're like, well, forget it. It's, it's not working. You know, I got some friends who kind of give up a little bit because, but when, you know, they're like, oh, it's not working. I had one girlfriend. I was like, oh my gosh, she's not going to make it. Now she's 15 pounds down. She put on a medium the other day. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? She was like, yeah, but positivity that you can do this one day at a time. Cause I guarantee you December is coming. And that's what I told all my friends. You can be 350 pounds or you can be a different weight, but December is still coming. It doesn't matter. Every day you make a change on this journey, it is still coming. So I encourage my friends. I'm like, girl, you're doing good. Drink more water. Just walk a little bit. It's very important. Even if you just walk around in circles, you walk in your house. It's little. I couldn't do the elliptical for five minutes when I started. But I started with five minutes. I know I'm getting off off message, but I'm get, I'm bringing it back around. I'm securitous and whatever that word was. I'm bringing it. Yeah, that word. <laughs> She's coming back. <laughs> I'm coming back. So I think what we're, what we're really getting at is encouragement. We, you know, I don't want to hear, oh, you fat. I don't want you big. I don't want to hear, oh, you eating that horrible, horrible stuff. I don't want to say hear you say that. Say, you know what? You know, there might be a better choice of instead of eating a whole bag of marshmallows, why don't you take out two, you know, or something like that. These are the words you can't, I don't want to hear. I've heard, I, I used to think my name was uh, fat and bald headed because that's what my brothers called me my whole life because my mother, my grandmother cut off my hair so I had a little afro and my brother's like, you fat and bald headed. I, was, I thought that was my name, but it did something to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So you start believing that. And then you got to fight through that with everything else. So words are powerful and we need to take take those words, take them away, Ch exchange them with other words. You know what? My, my brothers might have said, Kim, you so you cute. You so cute. I'd be cute. I'd be cute and bald headed, but I'd be cute. I'd be like, I am cute. I'm cute. I'm cute. It's different. It, it changes the way you feel about yourself. The most powerful message you should receive are the ones you give yourself. That is for sure. Kim Whitley, thank you so much for sharing this part of you with us. And we're so glad you're going to stay with us for this journey. I'm going to bring in some of our panelists tonight to continue where Kim and I are leaving off. And so allow me to introduce 
our panel, a dynamic panel tonight, Dr. Michael Knight, who is an obesity medicine physician at George Washington University here in Washington, DC. Dr. Fatima Coney Stanford, she's an obesity medicine physician at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We also have Courtney Christian, who is a senior director for pharma. Um, she's a senior director of policy and research for pharma. And we have Joe Naglowski, who is the president and CEO of the Obesity Action Coalition USA. Thank you all for making the time tonight. I'd like to start with the doctors right now and Dr. Stanford specifically. Why don't we take that same question that we left with Kim about stigma, the stigma of being overweight. How does the stigma of being overweight, the stigma of obesity and the stigma of language impact the choices we make? Well, thanks, first of all, for having me. But I definitely want, I want to, you know, already kind of criticize some things that I've heard so far. So I don't know if you guys have been watching the chat. So we have to be really, really careful about the language we use. We want to delete a few words from our vocabulary. One of the words that I want all of us to delete, anyone that's listening, is the word obese. Just get rid of it. Throw it out the window. Obesity is a disease. So people have the disease of obesity. We have like a woman with obesity, a black woman with obesity. So we can not define her by that. She can be defined by her blackness. She can be defined as being cute, as Kim said a little earlier, mm -hmm. but she has obesity. So we wanna remove some of that. It's this idea of people first language. The person is first, mm -hmm. they have this disease. So we have a person with overweight or a person with mild, moderate or severe obesity. If we change that language, we begin to depersonalize, destigmatize this idea or concept that obesity is a personal choice, a, a something that someone asked for, something that someone did wrong. Yes, do lifestyle factors contribute, but it's a multifactorial disorder. And what we do know is that obesity is a relapsing, remitting, progressive disease. So what I heard when I was listening to Kim's story is this kind of constant up and down. And also she said a lot about that in her mother's life. Um, and so that's, that's something we need to think about. When physicians or other healthcare providers approach patients in a way that's free of stigma and free of bias, we're able to make significant progress in the care of their often lifelong battles with this disease of obesity. So that's how I would answer that, my dear. I think though, from what I'm hearing you say and what we heard Linda say, that this idea of bias and racism impacts every part of our lives. And it has to play a role when we talk about obesity. When you think about cortisol and stress levels, if, if black women are walking around in a traumatized state with high cortisol levels in their bodies, it would naturally be difficult for us to lose weight if that was something we were trying to do than someone who's not having our world experience. How would you say racism impacts the disease of obesity? Oh, so racism has a direct correlation um, with obesity, particularly in black women, the group that's most impacted by this disease in our country. One of the things we heard earlier is that 80% of women have overweight and obesity in the United States. That is, that is a large insurmountable number. What we do know is that if we were to talk to most black women, um, if not all black women, they could really detail almost a daily interaction with racism. Racism caused stress, and not only does cortisol go up, but other inflammatory markers in the body go up. When inflammation increases in the body, the body likes to store fat, or what we call adipose tissue. Where does that fat like to be stored? It likes to be stored in our midsection, so in our abdominal region. That is around a lot of really important organs, around our liver, around our heart. It leads to what we call metabolic disease, such mm -hmm. as diabetes, and this is this chronic exposure to racism, which is part of our daily life and something that I can detail in my life, starting at the age of three, is something that lends itself to greater deposition of fat or adipose tissue. And that just chronically builds up over one's lifetime. So I think that they're completely intertwined. And so we can't divorce racism um, from black women and our struggles with overweight and obesity. 
What have you found to be a sage approach to helping people who are dealing with the disease of obesity? Or if they're not dealing with obesity, they're trying to simply lose weight. What are some of the interventions and, and strategies you think have worked? Well, I think that we have a lot of modalities that we can utilize to treat patients that have obesity. And what I find is tailoring the approach to the person. So we can use lifestyle modification where we're focusing on things like diet, exercise, quality and duration of one's sleep, or maybe even looking at the medications that you might be prescribed by your physician, some of which can cause weight gain, for example. That might be one umbrella. So that's kind of the lifestyle behavioral modification group. There are some patients that require pharmacotherapy, which is medications to treat their obesity. And that's something that is grossly underutilized. Only 2% of patients that meet the criteria for the utilization of medications for the treatment of obesity actually receive that in the United States. So only 2%. So you can imagine that if we were to sparse, parse that out, I guess, in terms of looking at what do Black women get, I would say that number is even uh, more um, minuscule. And then when we go to looking at metabolic and bariatric surgery, which is by far the most effective treatment to date for those that have severe obesity, only 1% of patients that meet criteria for utilization of bariatric surgery actually get access to that. I use all combinations of those across the age range. I see people as, as young as two years old. I saw a three-year-old as my first patient this morning and people as old as um, a 90. So I kind of really go across the lifespan and I treat a lot of families. Um, I find what works for that individual and whatever we do, we wanna sustain over the life course. Wow. Um, Dr. Knight, I, I wanna ask you some questions as well because I know that uh, what I've been reading is that black women tend to generally have a good a healthy view of ourselves, where, wherever we are in the spectrum of health. But it sounds like we've got to do some reshaping of the perception of weight so that we understand, to your point, Dr. Stanford, about treating the person where they are, what a healthy weight is for us as individuals. How do we begin to do that? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. It's so important because we want to promote body positivity. And so when patients come into my office here in Washington, DC, you know, we start thinking about what's your personal goal. A lot of people go into their physician or healthcare provider's office and they hear the BMI, right? We've all heard of the BMI and they show you where you are on the chart. And for many black women, I think many women in general, when they look at that, they say, well, what number am I supposed to be? And sometimes that number just looks so far away and they can't even imagine being that number or they've never been that number since high school. That may not necessarily be your goal. We have to understand that obesity and excess weight, as Dr. Stanford said, is a chronic medical condition. And so when we think about your goals, how is it affecting your health? Is it causing any uh, conditions? You know, uh, Kim was talking about prediabetes. That's mm -hmm. one of the conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure. I even have patients with heart failure and kidney disease that we are trying to address a weight or excess weight because of a health outcome. It's not to get to a size zero. Everybody who walks in my, sometime they tell me, I don't wanna lose my curves. I don't wanna lose what I have. And that's, we have to love people at all different sizes, but we have to understand the health outcome. And so that's a conversation and it's important for your healthcare provider to understand that. Because if all they're gonna say is, if you're not this number on my paper, then you'll never be healthy and I can never do anything for you. That's an immediate barrier. And that really stops the conversation for so many patients. It's interesting that you talk about numbers. So uh, a year or so ago, I started working on this story, which I've since abandoned because of COVID, but it involved the GW Weight Management Center. And one of the things that they were trying to do was tailor weight loss to your health. So you do a metabolism thing and you blow into this mask for 30 minutes and then they do a DEXA scan and they scan your body. And when they printed out the results, they told me that I had 35% body fat, that I was essentially skinny fat. 
So I had the body fat of a woman who might be larger than me. And so when you all talk about these numbers and these, these aggregate things that we've used as a nation to measure and to curate who's healthy and who's not, it made me wonder if these things are actually doing us a greater disservice because they do not take into consideration who we are. And so I wonder when you get people who come to you, Dr. Knight, who are coming for help and for resources, many of them may have not even had the opportunity to receive that information I had. How much is lack of access to information, to, uh, to good uh, sage advice, how much of a role does that play in the people that you see in your office? That plays a huge role because like you said, it's more than just one number and also the data. So when we think about the data, it's not only do we want data to be helpful, we want it to be interpreted correctly. Whether it's your BMI, whether it's your body fat percentage, these are all just pieces of the puzzle. I wanna know uh, how's your metabolic health? How is your risk for heart disease? How is your risk for other metabolic conditions before we find out what your personalized goal is? So any provider or anyone who's just looking at one number, just looking at the BMI, just looking at the body fat percentage is not giving you a comprehensive approach. We have to understand that obesity is a comprehensive and complex condition. It is not a one size fits all. Oftentimes patients come in and say, well, this worked for my friend and this worked for my girlfriend. You know, I want to get on this medication. I want to get on this plan. And anyone that's just going to hand that to you and take a check from you is probably not doing you the best service. What they need to say is, let's step back and let's understand what your personal issue is and how can we customize a plan no two patients walk out of my office with the same plan because everybody is different everyone's story is different and then that first interaction i'm talking about what happened in high school i'm talking about what happened in elementary school and if you're not having that kind of conversation it's going to be very difficult to unpack the reasons behind your obesity and then understand how can we be successful together to bring you to the optimal health that you deserve. Because that's really what it's all about. At the heart of, of issues of weight it is getting to the heart of a person, right? What is your relationship with food? What is your relationship with movement? What has your relationship been with family? All of these things can have an impact on, on who you are and how you present uh, when, you, when you do have to potentially seek out some help. Um, let me bring Joe Naglowski into this conversation because he is the president and CEO of Obesity Action Coalition. And Joe, I know you've had your own personal struggle uh, with this disease of obesity, which brought you to this as your life's work. Um, when we talk about communities of color, though, and we've heard Dr. Stanford talk about it, we've heard Dr. Knight talk about it, there's this buzzword now that we hear a lot of people talking about. It's social determinants of health. Do you have a job? Where do you live? Do you have access to food? What's nearby? How do all of those things contribute to the disease of obesity in communities of color specifically? Yeah, so I wanna be pretty bold here and say, you know, a lot of times the perception that we heard uh, Leslie talk about at the beginning that obesity is all about self-control or personal responsibility. And actually, I think that your social determinants of health actually play a much greater role in, in someone's obesity uh, than, um, than anything that is within personal control. You know, whether it's financial stress, lack of healthy food options, lack of opportunities to engage in activity because of the way the environment is built or even safety concerns, right, around that, you know, can you, or is it safe to go out and exercise and, and lack of access to healthcare. I mean, think about what you just heard from Dr. Stanford and Dr. Knight. These, these are two providers that you likely want to see to help you with your obesity based on what they've shared so far. But, but many of us won't uh, have access to this, whether we don't have healthcare in the first place, or even if we have healthcare, if, if our healthcare uh, insurance doesn't allow access to obesity care. So. How do we, you know, obesity is near epidemic levels in this country. And I hear talk of, um, anti-obesity medicines and questions about whether there will be reimbursements for those treatments and even conversation about the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act. For folks who, who are new to this conversation, because uh, we talked a little bit about the medicine, tell me a little bit more about uh, the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act. 
Yeah, so so one of our challenges I just mentioned was, you know, not everyone has access to the treatments of obesity. So, you know, actually my organization is based in Tampa, Florida, and for no amount of money can I buy insurance for my employees that includes obesity care. That's crazy, right? That, that we have this as our biggest epidemic in our problem in our country, and we don't have access to that kind of care. And so one of the things the obesity advocates have done over the last couple of years is uh, help have in legislation introduced in Congress called the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act. Now, TROA, as the, we abbreviate it, is actually focused on Medicare. So, so why do you, well, because you know the federal government controls Medicare, so obviously we'll ask them to write legislation around it. But what it would do would expand the kind of providers who can provide care for Medicare recipients uh, to receive obesity care. So you could see Dr. Knight, or you could see Dr. Stanford. Right now, if you're on Medicare, the only person you can see to counsel you about your weight is your primary care provider. And let's be honest, mm -hmm. for those of us who have gone to our primary care provider, what happens when they talk to you about your weight? They usually just wag their finger at you and tell you to lose a few pounds and don't come back until you have, right? Kind of thing, that, that's the reaction. So that legislation is, is trying to expand the providers, both to specialists like Dr. Knight and Dr. Stanford, but also to dietitians and other people in the community who can provide that care. And then the other thing it does is it, it takes away this prohibition of prescribing anti-obesity medications for, for people as well. So when the original um, medic, that legislation actually, the, the language in Medicare came out of old Medicaid legislation. And back then we didn't have good quality anti-obesity medications. We have that now, those that have been approved in the last few years and we have even better ones coming. So uh, the reality is, is I believe strongly that you know, if you wake up this morning and say, today's the day I want to do something about my obesity, we need to, every, everyone's insurance needs to cover that. And we need to make sure people have the chance to get as healthy as possible. Let's stop putting barriers in front of people. And one of those lar largest barriers is, is our insurance and what's covered and what's not covered. You know, it's an interesting policy thing you talk about, but, uh, you know, I, I work in Washington where, uh, you know, most congressional members are not getting much done here. They aren't agreeing on much. So uh, it, it sounds like we can't really rely on the legislative efforts right now to come through on this or, or, or a lot of things right now. I have to be careful how I choose my words very carefully. So uh, it, it sounds like though it, that if people don't even have access to the resource of a Dr. Stanford or a Dr. Knight, and the only point of contact they have is their, their primary care doctor, and they are overwhelmed, you can see how this sets up a perfect storm, a cycle of sorts. And people who uh, may be dealing with the disease of obesity um, get lost in the shuffle. Yeah, I agree completely. And I, and I will say, although I know our elected officials are busy um, and um, you know, the, the one thing that's happened with COVID is that because we know, and as mentioned earlier on, there are such of these consequences of COVID for people living with obesity that, you know, it, it is our hope that actually in one of the next, if, if there is one, of course, in the lame duck sension, a, a pandemic relief package, that we could actually have the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act attached to that. Because wouldn't it make sense, right, if we're, as we're addressing the pandemic of COVID, that we also address the pandemic of obesity at the same time. So, so there, there is some hope there, but if not, we'll, we'll wait till next Congress and we'll start again and, and we'll keep up the good fight. Joe, so thank you for that segue. I'd like to bring Courtney Christian in now because uh, I, I wanna have you talk about pharma for me, but also talking about how obesity uh, impacts comorbidities like diabetes. You know, you had Kim say she has, uh, she's pre-diabetic and you know, black folks talk about the sugar, right? We like the sugar, but we don't want that kind of sugar. Um, and, and, and we can laugh about it, but there are serious, serious impacts. When we take a look at the impact of obesity on COVID and diabetes. So can you, can you connect those dots for us? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I think we've gotten a really great sort of provider perspective from the doctors tonight. Uh, the, the, the the perspective of insurance design and how sometimes it's a barrier to access self care and getting folks connected to the sort of care that they need to um, to treat their condition. Oh, obesity, Dr. Stanford pointed out. Uh, but at Pharma, we represent you know thirty of the leading the the country's leading biopharmaceutical companies. Uh, we're really um, focused on finding treatments and cures that allow patients to live longer and healthier and more productive lives. Uh, and we put quite a huge investment in it. And, you know, at the moment we're 
have a laser focus on finding a vaccine for COVID-19, but uh, we also have researchers working on treatments and cures for the range of chronic conditions that, you know, obesity also is, is, is usually an underlying factor for. And so from a therapeutic perspective, you know, there are medicines available, as the doctors alluded to, that can do, be used to use to do things like reduce hunger and cravings, control cravings. But we know that any therapy has to be, you know, in combination with a treatment plan that includes exercise and portion control and, and therapy. Uh, you know, getting real about equipping people with the emotional tools to get at the root causes of issues that may cause fluctuations in weight, because we know that obesity and uh, all the other chronic conditions that are driven by that are big healthcare spenders in, in, the, in the healthcare system in our country. Uh, we estimate that between 2016 and 2030, $42 trillion uh, is gonna be the cost of the US healthcare system on chronic diseases uh, that include obesity. So I think we can all agree that the, the best treatment is no treatment. The best, the most cost effective treatment is no treatment uh, because we're doing all the things on the front end uh, with work on prevention and diet and exercise as mitigation tools. But we're also, if treatment is needed, uh, making sure that patients get the right medicine at the right time and a treatment plan that's right for them and that they can be adherent to. Listening to Kim talk about her son, I, I had a son too much shy of 40. He's about to turn five. And uh, it's important for me to model also good behaviors for him, uh, good healthy be behaviors for him. He has a pre-existing condition. Uh, he was on blood pressure medicine from four months old to two years old. And so it's we have these uh, conversations about you know nutritious food, getting good exercise, uh, maintaining a healthy lifestyle so that he can achieve his optimal health. But I think what we're seeing right now is that you know this gross impact of COVID-19 on our community, um, especially among people who have underlying chronic health conditions. Uh, one of the issues that we're looking at at Pharma and we've been looking at is preventable uh, diabetic amputation, keeping folks in our communities um, from having to get amputation uh, due to um, issues with treatment and, and diabetes, getting to the disease progressing to a point where they have to get an amputation. And we had done an analysis um, really on New York State, starting out with New York State and seeing where uh, amputations were really high in communities of color and underserved communities. And then we saw COVID-19 hit, hit New York and saw the numbers and we decided to overlay that data on top of the amputation data that we already had. And wouldn't you know it, the COVID-19 impact had, this, had the same impact in the same communities of, uh, with folks with high incidence of diabetic amputation. And so, you know, that, that obesity as a leading driver of that is something that we have to fix um, because we can see now with this epidemic and this pandemic, uh, the, the, the effect. Huge effect. And, you know, I, most of us, a lot of us have family members. My mom has diabetes. And so I haven't seen my mom since February because I'm really concerned about making sure that she's healthy and she's safe. She's in that population. Um, let's drill down just a little bit more on um, on diabetes and amputations specifically in the black community. Is it is it also just because of the, the same things we've been talking about, access to care, um, you know, getting to the doctor later, not having uh, access to healthy food, all of these things, are we talking about the exact same thing that's coming together to, pre to present this, this awful, horrible um, result for far too many of our family members? I think we are. We're talking about a perfect or imperfect storm of factors that that create this the situation for our communities. Um, I, I don't know if you all have seen it. There's a ProPublica article that was published, I think, earlier this year um, that looked at amputations, did a deep dive on amputations, diabetic amputations in Mississippi and the COVID impact. It was called the Black American Epide Amputation um, mm -hmm. Epidemic. And what it found was a lot of the factors that uh, caused that epidemic within the state were a lot of the things we were talking about, food deserts, inability to access nutritious foods, uh, unequal access to health care and unequal access, uh, unequal health care utilization um, that had a downstream effect of people losing their jobs, lost wages, lost productivity. Uh, so all those things kind of come together in a way that uh, you know, doesn't also serve to our, doesn't always serve to our good. 
I think this has been a really important conversation and I see a lot of questions coming in for all of you. So I wanna make sure that we give people an opportunity, a chance to ask their questions. But first, let me say to Ken Whitley and Dr. Knight and Dr. Stanford and Courtney Christian and Joe Naglowski, thank you so much for your insight tonight, for sharing your heart tonight, for allowing people to hear from you about your expertise and how they can make their lives better. Let me start with a question because Kim, there are a bunch of questions for you. And one of them is, hold on, I'm going past it a little bit. <laughs> all, all, all these doctors on here and they want to ask me well, a question? Yes, yes. One, on one of them question? wants to know, what advice do you give someone who is looking to break the yo-yo cycle of weight gain and weight loss? Kim. Well, let's see. I, I don't want judgment from all these professionals on here, <laughs> but the, first of all, is seek out uh, one of the professionals on here. That is the first thing you do. Um, because what I have learned is the first thing, even for me, that I go up and down. When I go up, it's because I don't care anymore. I just go eating anything and everything. And the, the access, because I'm not educated, and I just have to say this quickly, educate yourself on what to eat and how to eat. But you also have to go to, you know, you have to reach out to a professional and say, like a nutritionist or someone, how do I do that? But you have to make a commitment to yourself. And, and your friends and family have to say, be there with you. If you start going up, I tap my friend and I say, hey, 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 you gained a little weight there. I know, I know, but that's all I'm doing. I'm not offering anything to help them. And that's why uh, WW has helped me because it's not a diet. It's a way of life. You have to say, you already know what the food tastes like. I don't need to go back and eat a cheesecake every week. I've had a cheesecake in my life. I've had greens. I've had macaroni and cheese. I know what it tastes like. Why do I have to keep eating it? You know what it tastes like. And don't deprive yourself. That's the one thing you can say, you know what? I'm going to eat a mac and cheese on Saturdays. I'm going to have, but you, you know, maybe once a month or I'm going to have a good meal. But when people stay a diet and they deprive themselves, I think that's when you start yo-yoing. You have to find a way to survive and eat good food. Your metabolism is like a fire. You got to keep putting logs in the fire. Just don't put bad <laughs> logs in there. That's all I got to say. Help somebody pray on that. was some I, good I don't, I don't real talk. talk this people. one, this yeah. one is for Dr. Stanford and Dr. Knight. There are a lot of people who are writing, talking about the correlation you mentioned between stress and weight gain. And so there, there are people who are asking, how do they curb their stress to achieve weight loss? You know, how can you lose weight when you know that you are under stress? Perhaps you are an essential worker and you're the, you're the head of household and you've got to go to work at the grocery store or you've got to deliver that mail or you've got to deliver those packages. How can you in that already extreme group um, work to, to stimulate weight loss for you? How do you do that, Dr. Stanford and Dr. Knight? Yeah, I, I will start. Dr. Knight and I will tag team each other. We work together um, in many facets mm -hmm. in, of our lives. So I think that we'll be able to handle this one. Um, I think it's about finding what works for you. So I think some of my family is watching and they know I am a fitness enthusiast. But fitness for me, and it's important for us to think about the fact that exercise on average leads to weight stabilization, but it is an excellent stress reliever. So if you wanna catch me in a bad mood, you want me to do some kickboxing. You want me to do things that for me help alleviate my stress burden. I work between 80 and 100 hours a week. After I finish this, I will be doing another lecture until 10 p.m. tonight. I know that that is stressful for me. So I have to find what works for me and I can't extrapolate that out directly to my patients. So maybe my patients hate kickboxing. Maybe they like skiing. Now I hate skiing. So we need to find, you know, maybe that's physical activity is a form of, of ways to alleviate stress. For me, faith is a huge part of who I am. My Christian faith is, is where I seek a lot of solace. Um, maybe it's prayer or meditation and prayer combined that helps alleviate stress. So it's about finding those things that work for that individual, recognizing that the 
you know, the big diaspora of patients that Dr. Knight and I see may require different individual things to tailor to fit those individuals. But even those essential workers like myself and Dr. Knight and those people that are working at the grocery stores that are the postal carriers or whatever they may be doing that they have to be out there in the midst of this pandemic, that they're able to get to their true selves. Um, I'd love to hear Dr. Knight's response, however. You know what, Dr. Knight, and, mm -hmm. and I think also, if you're when you're responding, there are questions about how important is customization for a weight loss plan. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, customization is vital. It's important. If someone is handing you a printout, as you said, this is all you need to do. Just follow this, and you'll lose weight. Uh, then you need to call call me or call Dr. Sanford or call somebody. <laughs> Uh, because it, it, you are a different person, you know, your lived experience is different than someone else. And it's not a cookie cutter response. So we have, we spend, when I first see a patient, I'm spending at least 40 minutes talking about their journey up until they walked into my office. Only then can I understand what they need. When we talk about stress, I always ask my patients, you know, how would you rate your stress level on an average basis? If you are at a 10 and you're, you know, worried about your job and putting food on the table, am I really, maybe this is not the time, the best time for us to, to be aggressive. Maybe we need to try to stabilize weight and then let's work on some other things. I work with psychiatrists. I work with psychologists. We address a mental health. Mental health is a huge piece. And we know that many people use food as a way of coping. So unless you give them another coping mechanism, they're gonna keep going back to that. So we have to understand the stress, we have to understand the mental health, and it has to be customized to you. Your name, your birth date is different than someone else, mm -hmm. and so does your medical plan need to be. I think this is a question for any of you, and perhaps Joe, because you've walked this walk and you know intimately about navigating this disease of obesity as part of your own life's journey. There's some questions here about, you know, what do you do when you have people who are relatives or people you love who are trying to sabotage your weight loss efforts? How do you navigate that? What do you do? What do you say? Yeah, it's, all, it's always a tough, uh, you know, the saboteurs in our life are always tough to deal with. But I, I do think one of the ways we um, deal with it is actually to be really open and, um, you know, honest about why you're on this journey, right? I, I, again, we've talked about it before a lot already. This is not about me trying to look like a men's health cover model or, or something along those lines. This is about me being as healthy as I can be to be around to play with my grandchildren someday and to, to have a high quality of life. And so I, I think if you talk to folks in that manner, uh, it's important, but but recognize it's gonna happen. All of us have that, all of us who have experienced some weight loss have that that person who say, you know, you're getting a little too skinny, right? Kind of thing. And, and, I, and I think again, if we can just reframe that and just say, look, this is about my health, right? And it's important to me that, you know, I, I can have the ability to function well and have a high quality of life for a long period of time as the reason, again, not, not some cosmetic goal, because I, th I think that our challenge with cosmetic goals is we never meet them, right? I think, I think you'll, you, you set yourself up for failure if you have solely have a cosmetic goal. And I, and I'm guessing, and I, I know I've heard Dr. Stanford say this before, she doesn't even set a weight num weight goal for her patients, right? Because the reality is this is about your health. It's not, it's not about reaching some uh, magical number on the scale. Uh, this is for the group, it, you know, food as medication that can be prescribed. Um, and could that be covered by health insurance? Is that a pipe dream <laughs> or is that realistic? So, so I've definitely, I will just comment, I've seen some really novel programs, one out of New Orleans that is a, a food for medicine program that runs out of Tulane University, where they actually have a, a program in the community where they teach people to shop healthy and, and provide healthy foods. And then they combine it with a uh, a, a weight management program. Uh, so I, I, th I think there are some novel ways to do it. Now, whether the food itself would be covered by your insurance or something along those lines, I don't, I don't think that portion is going to happen. Uh, but, um, but there are pro programs, I think, especially in communities where you could combine food as medicine with a, a traditional or, or even a personalized obesity management program and combine the two. And I think that'd be a highly effective way to, to help people uh, uh, better their obesity care. Courtney, here's it. Go ahead. 
you know, even if we push it, I was just going to say in Cleveland, Ohio, I know my brother uh, did a, a market, it's mm -hmm. called West Side Market. And what they did was not only put healthier foods in this place, uh, but they also put a kitchen in the back mm -hmm. to educate the community, to teach them how to cook healthier foods. So that's a great model if anybody wants to look up the West Side Market in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Now, if we did that in our communities, it would be... Uh, yeah, it would be helpful. very helpful. Courtney, I'm going to give you uh, one of the last questions here as we start to wind down. Is there a focus on weight around clinical trials for COVID-19? And is it important to test vaccines for varying BMIs? You know, that's a great question. As we follow the science to a vaccine and the cure uh, that turns around what 2020 turned into and hopefully makes 2021 better. Um, you know, it's very important that we have people that participate in these clinical trials of all races, all genders, all weights, all sizes, all ages to ensure that uh, whatever vaccine is ultimately uh, derived, that it works well for, you know, the most people that it can. And so that it is very important that people of varying weights uh, participate so that we can know uh, how that vaccine uh, reacts and acts. Uh, across uh, across those those different strata. Well, I want to thank all of you for your time tonight. I know that you have lots of things you could be doing, but you devoted an hour of your precious time to people who you may never know and whose lives you may have changed by what you said tonight. So to Kim Whitley and Dr. Michael Knight and Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford and Courtney Christian and Joe Naklowski, Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna turn this over to our esteemed president, Linda Guller Blount, to close this out on behalf of the Black Women's Health Imperative. Well, thank you so much, Leslie. There was, there was, so, so, there was so much information today and I know we could have gone an, another hour. Um, I, I hope that, that you listening and watching tonight got something useful and valuable, uh, um, if for no, if nothing else, at least language, people live with obesity. We don't, people are not obese. Obesity is a, is a disease, it's a syndrome, it's a set of conditions. And so we've got to learn to talk about it in, in the right way so that we don't stigmatize people. Um, I want to thank you all for attending. Um, I hope that you found some strategies to help. You've got some resources to turn to. And as Leslie said, you know, this is to help you with your journey to walk with light, with joy and purpose to be your healthiest self. It's not about how you look, it's about how you feel. I would like to personally thank our moderator, Leslie Foster, special guest, Kim Whitley, and our esteemed panelists, Dr. Michael Knight, Dr. Fatima Coney, Cody Stanford, Joe Naglowski, and Courtney Christian. And thank you to all of you for tuning in tonight, for listening, for learning, and for, for your questions. Good night and please be safe.